Father, we pray that you hear the praise of our lips. We are so in love with you, and we are a distracted people at the same time, Father. There is just so much stuff going on in our lives, and we feel the need to simplify. We feel the need to always be in the business of reconnecting with you because of your awesomeness and your greatness. Father, give us a vision of you and your natural essence. Give us a, a vision, Father, of what it's like to be with you on that one great day. Father, help us to understand who we are right now and that you indwell us. And Father, we ask for you to fill us with your spirit. I ask for your spirit to be poured out upon us this morning as we, as we look into your word. And I ask, Father, for us to be stirred deeply in our souls. And, and I, Father, thank you for, for Ray and what he said earlier about just doing something. Our lives are ministry. Ministry is our life. It's not some sort of separate, separate something that we do. It's who we are. And I'm asking, Father, that you would so uh, endow us this morning that we would hear your word particularly about all this, all this stuff. We love you, Father. We can't begin to express it in any way that does you justice. So we'll just hold it up to you in Jesus' name. The church said, Amen. Amen. Y'all have a seat. Grab your Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we are. Let me say to you once again, welcome to all of you guys. I'm just glad that you're with us. And if you're live streaming with us this morning, we're glad that you're with us as well. And we'll all turn together to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 4. And, and let me tell you what we're going to be looking at here in 2 Corinthians. It actually is on the heels of what we talked about last week. Last week we were at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul is talking about this parade that we're in, this triumphal procession. That, that Jesus is the leader and all of us are the vanquished enemies. You have been conquered by Jesus. Amen? Is that right? You've been conquered by Jesus Christ. And if you hadn't been, you got some real, you got some other issues you're struggling with in your life. I, I know I'm right about that, all right? So we are the conquered, vanquished, at one time enemies of Jesus, but now we're a part of his triumphal procession. As we are paraded before the world, they get a whiff of what we're like. To some people, we smell like death. And other people we smell like, like life. And, and what our business is, is we're in the business of kicking down the walls. Whether those are personal walls that we've put around us or those are walls that we've built around church. You know, sort of like we're just kind of separate apart from life and the world and we seem odd to everybody. We kick down all of those walls and we build relationships just for this reason. So people can get close enough to get a whiff. It's between them and God as to how that all works out, if it's a smell of life or it's a smell of death. But we want them to get close enough to get a whiff. And everything that we do, you guys, that's of any consequence at all, that has any lasting significance in the kingdom, is because of the Holy Spirit of God that indwells us. It's because of His power and His might. And it's through Him that anything really happens. I, I want to tell you about a guy that I met over 30 years ago now. His name is Donald. I met him up when I was preaching. Karen and I were up in a little church in Arkansas. And I may have told some of you guys about this guy before, but uh, I, I love this guy. He loved God. He loved Jesus. He loved the church. Uh, always had his Bible. I can't even really picture him without his Bible tucked under his, under his arm. And, and everybody loved him. Everybody in the congregation loved him. They would always greet him with a, hey, Donald. But he was one of those guys, um, he, he never got invited over to anybody's house for football and nachos. You know what I'm saying? He... Everybody loved him, but he just wasn't really close to anybody. He was an old bachelor uh, fella, actually. When I met him, he was probably in his 50s, maybe early 60s, maybe late 40s. I'm not sure exactly, somewhere in that, uh, in that range. And uh, bless his heart, when they were handing out looks, I mean, he was absent that day. All right, you hear what I'm saying? I mean, I don't really, can't really assess how dudes look, but I mean, I could tell this guy was probably hurting in that department pretty well. And uh, he had a kind of a permanent front, sort of the howl scowl, but it was uh, uh, exponentially beyond uh, my facial expression, I think. Because even when he laughed, it looked like he was upset, sounded like he was upset, kind of an angry, vile, evil kind of laugh, you know what I'm saying. Y'all getting the picture of this guy? And he always wore uh, coveralls. I never saw him anything other than coveralls. Maybe once or twice I did. Denim coveralls, brogans on his feet, um, but loved Jesus. And the most outstanding thing about Donald was his speech impediment. You couldn't understand Donald unless you spoke Donnellese. And it was a language that was really difficult to understand. It was hard to understand uh, what he said. And I remember one time before I had actually mastered the language, uh, he came to me, and here's what he said. And I, this is, I got to speak Donnellese pretty carefully, so I'm, this is pretty accurate. He said, I, I pity. 
I said, uh, excuse me, Don, say that again. I died to hot pity. I said, Don, I'm so sorry. Could you tell me that one more time? At, le at least, I'm thinking. Tell me that one more time. What did you say? And he got exasperated. He kind of... Did that? He said, I da do hot pity, hot pit, hot pity, hot pity, I da do hot pity. And Jerry Heron was walking by, a good friend of mine, he walking by, and he said, Dude, he's telling you, I got to go to the hospital. I da do hot pity, hot pity was hospital. See, Donald, um, sharp as a tack, but when he was three years old, he swallowed some lye. His mother was making lye soap. And it had done a lot of damage down in through here and paralyzed part of his muscles. And so he became Adado Hapiti. But let me tell you something about Donald. In the years that I knew him, I saw him teach and baptize three people. Somebody say amen. Now, is that because of his brogans and coveralls? Was that because of his expression, his pleasing? Listen, that's because of the aroma. The Spirit of God within, God does things. And sometimes the, the, the further away we are from anything that seems likely, the more powerful that testimony becomes. Now, in chapters 3, 4, and 5 of 2 Corinthians, Paul explains that dynamic. That's what he's here to do this morning. All right, That's what we want to see him do. He's going to explain that dynamic a little more fully. And as chapter 3 opens up, he talks about the contract that we have with God. And contract is not really the word that usually translates from the Greek word. It's usually the word covenant, right? Old covenant, new covenant. God's had lots of covenants with people. There's a covenant he had through Adam and the covenant he had with Noah. But the biggest in the Old Testament was the Old Testament covenant. And the one that you and I are under right now is the, what, New Testament covenant brought about through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so as he starts talking about that in chapter 3, he's describing this covenant. And here's the words that he uses. He says it's a covenant about life. Because the old covenant was really about death. It gave you all the rules. You know what you needed to do. But there was no power to live it. And, and you know what I think? I think there's a lot of folks right now under the new covenant that are still kind of under that old covenant sort of system because you're beat down and you're beaten up and you can't seem to get your, see your way clear. You don't understand the notion of grace that comes by the blood of Jesus Christ. Man, that's the good news, you guys. The good news is not baptism. The good news is the grace of Jesus Christ and the indwelling Spirit of God. That's what that's all about. See? So he says it's about life. And you know what else he says? He says it's glorious. It's more glorious than you can even imagine. Just let your eyes kind of filter down through chapter 3, the opening verses. Or actually all of chapter 3. It's glorious. And then he starts talking about the personal benefits to this covenant, to this contract that you and I have. And here's the concepts that he talks about. He talks about confidence. And he talks about boldness. You'll see the word bold in the NIV if you're looking down through those verses. And he talks, about, he talks about the hope that we have, this confident expectation that's ours. And then in verses 16 and 17, he talks about freedom, freedom. He says, in Jesus Christ, look at I think we've got that on the screen. In Jesus Christ, the veil is taken away. He's using a lot of Old Testament imagery and some things that involved uh, Moses. We're not going to go into all of that. But it's only in Jesus Christ. Look here, you guys. It's only through Jesus Christ that life begins to make sense. That somehow or another, the pieces come together. Now, I don't mean to tell you that every question is answered and you don't have any issues. But I'm, I'm telling you, life doesn't matter. The veil is taken away. Only in Jesus Christ. And it winds up in freedom. Freedom. I mean to tell you, probably, that's one of the things most precious, so precious to me. Freedom. I bow the knee to no man except King Jesus. Sometimes I do. And it's painful. It bothers me. But I want to tell you, freedom in Jesus Christ. And then he talks about one of the greatest blessings of all in verse 18. We are transformed. Not just changed, as I've said before, that's not a big enough word for what happens to God's people. We are transformed. And, and notice what he says in verse 18. This is something, as we reflect the Lord's glory, as we stare at Him, as we see Him, as we embrace Him, something, something starts to happen on the inside of you, right? That's where that aroma begins. That's where it starts, right? It's, it's through Him. And we are being transformed into His likeness. It's not that we transform. You can't do that. But it's something God does to you and for you so that we're transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory. And that's the aroma. 
as we're paraded before the world, Jesus Christ in the head, our captain, our captain, there he is in the lead, pulling us along behind, and we're just being the people that are bearing the aroma. Right? Now, nestled right in the middle of that is chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. So that's where I want us to be, okay? And he talks about three secret principles. And I, you know what? I don't really like the title. I don't really like to call it the secret principles, but I couldn't come up with anything better. You know, being a preacher is really a tough job, the decisions you have to make and the things you have to think of, okay? I don't really like it, but, but it'll be okay. Secret, I don't mean secret in the sense of hidden or in the sense of, man, you're going to hear something today you've never heard before. Nobody been as smart as I am to pull this. That's not what that is. But secret in the sense of these are meaningful these are the keys to, to principles to, to meaningful, successful ministry life. To meaningful, successful existence in the kingdom of God. And, 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 and I don't care what it is, whether you're a Bible class teacher, or you're a missionary to China, or you're just trying to figure out how to get through tomorrow morning with twins when you've already got four other ones. These are the principles that pull it together. This is the stuff, this is the stuff that, that makes it happen. Here's the, here's the chemistry of the aroma that comes out. All right? So here's three principles. One is in verse 7. The other one is in verse 13. Because I want you to go home today and I, I want you to read. The, I want you to spend a week looking at this. All right? Verse 7 is, is the first one. Verse 13 is the second principle. And verse 18 is the third one. And the first one, let's go back to the first one. And we're looking at really verses 7 through 12. But verse 7 has it. And, and, and here it is. This is, the, this is the, the, the secret principle that I call the paradox. You realize your life is a paradox. It's the paradox. That's what he talks about. We are, it is so powerful. It's so simple. It's so succinct. And yet it is so profound. Here's what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, he says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Now, don't, don't let it get past you, the importance of that. We have treasures in jars of clay. And you know, did you realize, you realize of course, you're in that verse. Because at the end of the day, that's all that we are. We're just jars of clay. Right? I don't care what you do for a living. I don't care how many letters are behind your name. At the end of the day, we're jars of clay. We're just dust bowls with a little bit of water and a few chemicals here and there. We're just dust, and we're struggling along here. And we're here for such a short time, you guys. I mean, we're just here, just, boy, just barely like that. Jars of clay. But inside the jar is this treasure. What a paradox. Now, what is the treasure? Well, you say it's the Holy Spirit, it's, and you'd be right. But look at how he describes it in verse 6. Here's the treasure. And I want to say it slowly because let it just sort of melt on your brain here. It is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What, are you kidding me? In this jar of clay? Really? Buddy, stand up just a second. <laughs> What'd you do to your face? You fell? I'm sorry to hear that. Do you believe, you guys? That's a jar of clay. Do you find that hard to believe? I don't. But there's a treasure in there. There's a treasure in there. It is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's in every last one of us. Thank you, buddy. And it's in us collectively as a body of people. That treasure, this beautiful treasure. It sounds so odd. I mean, it's like hanging the Mona Lisa in a garage, isn't it? And I, this is one of the wows of Scripture. You, inside of you, God has entrusted something. What was he thinking? How is it that he would entrust the likes of you and me with something like that? It sounds like, it sounds like a God who would make a nation out of a tribe of slaves, doesn't it? Or would, who would bring the King of kings and the Lord of lords into this world in a barn, born to peasants. It's crazy, isn't it? 
And do you know what this means? Now, let verse 7, let it just, here you are. We have this treasure in jars of clay. That's where the aroma comes from. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The more messed up the jar, the more powerful is the message. Do not decry your handicap or your problem or your struggle or your crises. The world has a clearer shot at grasping the all-surpassing power of God. Do you know what this means? It means that you, it means your life. Y'all hang with me on this. Your life is part of the message. The message is not just, here, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. The message is not just, uh, he was born in a manger and he's going to be in The message is not just that, and one day we're going to go see. The message is your life. It's your life. You cannot, you can't separate it. And if you try to separate it, it messes you up. See? This is why we kick down the walls, and this is why we, why we build relationships. Your life is part of the message. And listen, if you think it's particularly rough for you, is it? Some of us are going through some junk. I may know more about some of you guys than maybe other folks know about you guys. Some of us got some stuff going on, right? And the more extreme it is, the more difficult it is, take hope. Because look what he says. Here's the, here's the testimony. Here's the aroma that the world would see and that we would see to each other. Verse 8, we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. You see, just beat to an inch of your life, but there's the power, the treasure within and the more you're crushed, the more opportunity that folks have to see that around you. Don't get bitter. Please, don't get bitter about your junk. See the finger of God. This is the Word of God. Amen? If there's anything that we can trust in, we can trust in this. And here it is. There's a treasure inside of you because of who you are, because of your connection to Jesus. There's a connection. There's a, there's a, there's a treasure inside of you. And the more beat up and the more struck down and all that the more people are able to see your life is part of the message. We always carry around, verse 10, in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. Is that true just for apostles? It was certainly true for an apostle. But it's true for you and me. And the more we struggle, the more that aroma comes out. The more we struggle, the more people are able to see. See? Philip Yancey has written a book called uh, Disappointment with God. And I have to tell you, I love the title. And if you're not compelled by the title, check your pulse. Okay? Because we all know what it means to be disappointed with God. Is there anybody in here that, I'm not looking for a show of hands, but is there anybody in here that has never felt disappointment with Lord God Almighty? Where are you part of the time? What are you doing? Where, what is, uh, you know what I'm talking about. So it's a compelling book. It's dated now. It's been out for quite a few years, but it's a good read. If you had not read it, read it. You can borrow it from me. Oh, you can't have my copy. Never mind. Forget that part. I'm not that generous. But he tells about a lady that's a friend of his that lives up in Seattle. Uh, he loves this woman. She's just sharp. She's got lots of wisdom, spiritual wisdom that I'm talking about. Lots of spiritual wisdom and sense of humor, cutting edge sense of humor. It's great. But she also has cerebral palsy. And he says, I can't always understand all that she's saying. Kind of like Donald, but a little bit that I talked about earlier, but even more so. And uh, she's tremendously handicapped. And it's one of those diseases where everybody sees it. I mean, her arms jerk, he said, and she... She slumps over in her chair and her head rolls to one side and there's always, always drool coming out of her mouth. Kids on the college campus would see her and they would say she'd be in her wheelchair parked here or there, wherever it might be, and they'd say, there's the handicapped lady. And she'd be leaning over, slumped over her Canon communicator. It's a little device that helps her, you know, get her thoughts down on paper and that sort of thing. She's working on notes or working on a class or whatever it is. She took a two-year Associate of Arts degree and turned it into a seven-year Associate of Arts degree. Right? But when she got that, she enrolled in a Christian college and she started working on her degree in Bible. And if she'd been there two years, they asked her to speak in chapel. Can you imagine? 
So she's getting her speech together. By the way, how fast can you type? What? Somebody said, what? Not very? 45 words a minute? 60 words a minute? I heard Gene Brimmer. Some of you remember Gene Brimmer could type. I don't remember what it was. It was an unconscious number. They don't measure her. She didn't measure her typing in words per minute. It was minutes per page. 45 minutes to page. 45 minutes to a page. She worked painstakingly, painstakingly over her over her chapel presentation, and she wasn't going to speak it. Her friend Josie was going to speak it. Josie spoke in a clear, articulate voice, good speaker, confident speaker. On the day the chapel was there, uh, Josie got up to the podium, and on to the left of the podium was, was, was uh, Philip's friend sitting in the wheelchair. Uh, her arms would shake spasmodically. Her head would drool, and he said the whole time there was drool pouring out on her dress. And Josie began to spoke, speak what she had written. And he said it was incredible. Guess what her text was? For we have this treasure in jars of clay so that the all-surpassing power of God may be seen. Maybe we're beat down, but we're not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. That's what she... And he said it was incredible. It's like Granville Smith says, you could hurt a rat licking ice in there. Everybody was zeroed in. Oh, he's full of those things. <laughs> People were zeroed in on what she had to say. And, and, and let me tell you what they saw. Let me tell you better yet what they smelled. They smelled the aroma. Because they saw for the first time a whole person. The prose was beautiful. It was almost poetic. This brilliant mind trapped, trapped in this broken up body. And let me tell you, it is a metaphor for church. The beautiful head of Christ leading us on in triumph. And we're herky-jerky doing this and doing that and fighting with each other and all this other kind of stuff going on. But we bear the aroma of Jesus Christ because we have a treasure inside of us. Why did he do that? What is he thinking? Maybe we'll ask him one day. But here it is in jars of clay. There's the treasure. And the more broken and messed up we are, how much more beautiful is that testimony? Amen is right. So the first little key is a paradox. I'm going to do the second two kind of quickly. All right. Here's the second paradox. It's in verse 13. And I call that one, uh, the second principle I meant to say. And I call that one the power. The power. What is the power that makes all of this work? You want to say the Holy Spirit. Well, it is. But what is it that empowers? What is it that kicks the Holy Spirit into gear? Well, let's just let Paul say it. Verse 13. It is written. He's quoting Psalm 116. It is written. I believed. Therefore, I have spoken. With the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. How did he do it? How did he go from victory to victory, from beating to beating, from crushing to crushing? How did he go to Philippi, get skinned alive with a, with a stick, thrown in prison in the middle of the night? From there he goes to Thessalonica, where they, he has to leave town so they don't kill him. From there he goes to Berea, it looks pretty good, but the people from Thessalonica come from there and turn the crowds against him. From there he goes to Athens and they laugh him out of town. Why did he keep on? How did he do it? Here's his answer. Because I believe it. I believe the message that I speak. <laughs> and we're all here today. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Believe what exactly? Well, here's what he says. He says exactly what it is that I believe. Verse 14, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. Death is not the end. That's what he believes. He believes that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And he believes that I'm going to be raised from the dead. And he believes that we're going to all stand together in the presence of God one day. He says, I believe it. And because I believe it, I speak and I speak and I speak and I speak. And we just bear that aroma. Principle number three. is verse 18, but starting in verse 16. I, 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 I call this the perspective. Because okay? really, how you look at things is everything. How you look at stuff is everything. Determines your attitude, it determines all of it. 
So he says, verse 16, Therefore, we do not lose heart. I'm always encouraged. I do not get discouraged. (laughs) We do not lose heart. Though outwardly, we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, and here it is, drum roll, here it is. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Two realities. We've got the stuff right here, and that looms large on our screens, but then there's that eternal perspective, right? And that determines all of it. I don't care what's going on here, how beat up we are, how worn down we are, how betrayed by ministry (laughs) you may feel, or, or even, how about age? How old are you guys getting to be? (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of discouraging to age in this culture, isn't it? Because youth is pretty much the same, the thing. And I've, you know, it's, it is a little bit discouraging. You see this going on. There's a lady, I think it came with Reader's Digest, I think. But anyway, she's sitting in a dentist office for the very first time. Uh, very first time with this brand new dentist. Never met him before, knew his name, of course, or at least he was Dr. So-and-so. But she's sitting in the chair waiting for him to come into the room, and she sees a diploma up on the wall. It has his full name, and it rings a bell with her. And she's like, I went to school with a guy that had that same name. I wonder, it could be a, what a coincidence that would be. And she remembered the guy really well because she had a crush on the guy, right? In fact, she said every girl in school had a crush on this guy. It's just something else. And so she said, I wonder if this is really the same guy. But as soon as he walked in, she knew clearly it was not that guy because that big, thick head of brown hair was now a little gray, sparsely populated <laughs> sprigs here and there, and he had deep lines in his face, and she couldn't see any recognition at all. She knew that wasn't the guy. So he's cleaning her teeth, and when she gets, he gets done, she spits into the sink. She couldn't help herself. She said, say, she said, did you go to Morgan Park High School? He said, yep. He said, I'm a Mustang. He said it with pride. She said, uh, what year did you graduate? He said, 1959. She got so excited. She said, you were in my class. You were in my class. He said, really? He looked at her and he said, what class did you teach? (laughs) It's happening to all of us. You know why? Because we're jars of clay. But inside of you is a treasure. So he says, look. Fix your eyes on what is unseen. I've said this before. I want to say it again. How you look at things depends upon where you stand. Let me tell you where I stand. At the mouth of an empty tomb. And it changes everything. Right? Every last thing. So here you are. Here you are. Here's the chemistry. Here's the stuff that holds it all together. Verse 7 is a paradox. We've got a treasure inside this jar of clay. And the second principle is this power, this power that, that helps it all happen. Verse 13, because we believe, that's why we speak. And perspective is everything. We look at that, not this. Because that's what makes it happen. That's, that's how it works out. A few years ago, there was a fellow named Joey Lee. I'm going to tell you this and I'm done. Joey Lee was running in a marathon across the Moroccan Saharan Desert. Moroccan Sahara Desert. Takes eight days to run this marathon. And these guys run with backpacks on their back. And you're kind of pretty much you're out there on your own. The sand dunes and the sand and the rocks and all this kind of stuff. He's had about, 40, about 80 miles behind him. He's about halfway through the race. He's running. He's got to get 30 miles in that day when he blows out the air pockets in his tennis shoes. And of all the stuff that he was carrying, he didn't have another pair of tennis shoes. He's halfway through the race. It's like a piece of cloth then on his feet. I mean, over in excess of 100 degree temperatures, uh, sweltering conditions. Already a bunch of people had already dropped out of the race. He had every right to do it. But he stayed with it. He stayed with it. He stayed with it. Stress fractures all in his feet. By the time he got to the end, uh, he blisters everywhere. He was eaten alive. They said, why did you stay? And here's what he said, actually, in a word. Here it is. He said, Allison. Allison was his wife that had died 18 months earlier to cancer, and he was running to raise money for the American Cancer Society. Here's the perspective. Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's where we focus. 
That's what we see. Can we serve you in any kind of way this morning? Let us know about it as we, as we stand and sing. Lord, you have my heart, and, and I, I will search for yours. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice, and I will praise you, Lord. Sing of love come down, and as you show your face, we'll see your glory. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for you. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice, and I will praise you. See?